Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Lauren Gilbert. I'm the Senior Manager for Public Services here at the Center for Jewish History, which is the collaborative home for five organizations that together form the largest archive of the modern Jewish experience outside of Israel. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I am guessing that uh, a lot of you logging in for today's program are interested in genealogy. So for those of you who can't come in person to our Ackman and Ziff Family Genealogy Institute here at the center, which is open uh, Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., our two genealogy librarians are also available for one-on-one -on -one Zoom sessions. And if you would like uh, more information or to schedule a session, uh, please reach out to them uh, via email at gi at cjh.org. That's gi as in genealogy institute at cjh.org. Um, just a few of the usual housekeeping items before we get started. The chat is disabled for participants, so please put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, no need to raise your hand, and we will get to questions at the end. You can type them in as we go along, though. Uh, the, today's program is being recorded. It will be available on the center's uh, webpage and YouTube page within a couple of weeks. If you registered for this program, you will receive an email with the link to the recording. Uh, if you'd like to see the automated live captions and you're not seeing them, just click on the, uh, the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Okay, so our plan for today, um, our author and I will have a conversation, look at some photos, and then we will go to your questions and we should be all wrapped up uh, within one hour. So let me uh, introduce Lisa. Uh, Lisa Brahan is an accomplished Jewish genealogist and researcher. A graduate of George Washington University, she is a two-town project coordinator for the International Yisker Book Project on jewishgen.org. She was also named a double town leader for the website's Ukraine Special Interest Group Project, uh, now called Ukraine Research Division, where she has contributed online articles on the history of her ancestral towns in Ukraine. Um, this is her first book. So thank you so much for joining us, Lisa. Thank you, Lauren. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm going to jump in with some questions, but we also have some photos to look at. So let me just bring that okay. up on my screen. And okay, you're seeing that, right? I do. And if you could just hold that one, um, yeah. this is the most important uh, photograph of my genealogical journey. Um, the little baby is my grandmother, Hannah. Uh, her name in America was Anne. And when I was a little girl back in the 70s, I couldn't sleep. And she told me all these bedtime stories. And the only ones that I really had any interest in were ones drawn from her own youth. So she lived in a town, Stavisht, in uh, Russia at the time she was born. It became Ukraine shortly afterwards, which is why we have uh, both countries in the title of my book. And she survived a deadly wave of anti-Jewish massacres called pogroms. This was 20 years uh, before the Holocaust in 1917 to 1921. So we see her here pictured with my, this is what I call my beautiful ancestor, my great-grandmother, Rebecca Cutler Capro. She is a main character in my book and I knew her. Um, and I used to go visit her and this particular photo used to be up on our bookshelf and I was just enamored by it. Um, there was something about it that ignited in me like a lifetime desire to learn every detail of her past because it, it was obvious there was a world that came before mine and this is what sparked that interest. If you look really closely on it, there is water damage. And this photo fell into the Dinesta River when my family was running for their lives. They were, they were in a rowboat and the rowboat sank midway through and they, they were able to uh, stand and hold the children up, but the photos fell into the Dinesta. So they were bu busy fishing this photo out while they were afraid border guards were gonna shoot at them. And they saved this photo, um, which is you know why we see the damage and why it's, it's so dear to me. Um, 
basically Rebecca died in July of 1972. And when my mother and my cousin Ellis were busy cleaning out a closet in her apartment, I sort of swiped that photograph off of the shelf. I decided that I had to have it, Lauren. Um, my mother says I should never say the word swipe, that I just took it, but I literally swiped it. Um, and as you can see, um, 50 years after her death, we're now in July, 50 years later, it graces the cover of my book. Uh, and we have a couple of other pictures, yes. I think, of Rebecca and Connie. Yes, I'd like to just briefly say this one also went into the Dinesta River. It's also Rebecca and Hannah maybe a year or two later. Um, and I had it restored and colorized so you can see how beautiful that they were. Uh, she was a seamstress and she made their dresses. And I, we have a couple of pictures of your great grandfather as yes. well. The gentleman who is a little bit taller is my great grandfather, Isaac Kaprov. He is Hannah's father and Rebecca's husband, and he's looking quite dapper there. This, this photo was absolutely restored. It was almost completely damaged in the river. And can you tell us about this one, how he was a soldier? I would like to mention something very special, especially uh, genealogical wise. He was a soldier in the Tsar's army. This was taken in 1911 and he sort of got stuck in the army during World War I. Um, but he was um, wounded. And genealogically, I didn't know this, but in Russia or, well, I guess on a Russian website, I don't know if it's still available, but at the time, um, somebody found me, if you had an ancestor that was in the Tsar's army and was either killed or wounded with discharge papers, uh, they have a website where you could see those documents. So somebody a while back um, before the war did find um, documents on him. And from that, I learned he was all the way in Siberia. He was literally 19 miles from China. So they sent the men from Ukraine all over the place. And he literally stood by a river and could see the shores of China. Um, so one interesting story that came out of your research is the story of this uh, American Jew who returned to Europe to rescue uh, his family and ended up rescuing 80 other people as well, including your ancestors. Because can you talk a little about him? Absolutely. We're looking at a photograph of Barney Stumacher. Um, this is the most wild story in my book. Um, he was a wild guy. He had a lot of charisma. I guess they call it chutzpah. He, had, he was gutsy and he did something. There was something inside of this man that allowed him to do something miraculous. So uh, he was a young man after World War I. He was an American soldier and he receives this letter from his father who was living in Belitserka in Ukraine. By then my grandmother had fled Stavisht from the pogroms and they went on to Belitserka. And he writes Barney a letter and he says, uh, and it's in my book, by the way, all the correspondence, it's fascinating. Um, his father basically says, my dear son, if you don't come and save us from these pogroms, we're all going to die. And so what does Barney do? What does a good son do? Gets on a ship to Ukraine and he decides, he sets out um, to try to save his parents and three sisters. Um, all the Jews in Ukraine literally were trying to get out of Ukraine, and he was the only Jew trying to sneak in. So lots of things happened to him along the way. It was just one wild story after the next, but people helped him. They liked him. There was something about this man, and he makes his way to Belitserka. So imagine this. It's Yom Kippur evening in 1920, and what's going on in Belitserka? People are starving. There's pogroms, and he wanders in. By, on foot, um, almost like Elijah the prophet. Everybody comes out, they're screaming. My grandmother witnessed this. And he says to his parents, I'm here to save you. I'm going to bring you to America. So what do his parents say? Well, OK, but you're going to also bring like 50 or 60 of our nearest, dearest friends. So that wasn't enough because Rebecca, my great grandmother, had a sister who was married to one of his cousins, a Stumacher in Belitserka. And her name was Molly. And Molly said, well, I'm not leaving unless if you bring all the cutlers too. So there were another 20 or more people added to Barney's 50 or more. We, we got up to about 80 people. And he, he led the way on, my grandmother called them wagon trains, but they were like open wagons, wagon caravans. Um, 
He led them from Ukraine to Romania. Then once in Romania, Barney's group of about 58 people went on to America and my grandmother and her family were stranded. Um, they didn't have any passports. So there is one thing I wanna say about Barney um, before we go on. This young man, he led, before he received that letter, he led a, a very quiet life and uneventful life. Um, after he returned from saving people in 1921, the rest of his life, he led a very quiet and uneventful life. But that one year of his life from 1920 to 1921, this man was absolutely spectacular. Um, it, it is the wildest story. He saved 80 people, all of their descendants, and I am here today because of Barney Stumacher. Well, great that you could rescue this story and uh, spread the story of his heroism. Absolutely. I'm so glad to share it because he deserves to be remembered. Um, there was another character you came across, again, not someone who was part of your family, but ended up being connected to their story, and that was uh, Rabbi Pitsi Avram. So can you tell us what was remarkable, remarkable about him? Yes, uh, Rabbi Pitsy of Rami's the gentleman on the end with the beard. He's pictured here with his wife and his son. Well, he was the Rabbi of Stavisht, my grandmother's town. Um, he was another bright light. He was a remarkable man, but he truly believed that God was looking after him. And in return, it was his duty to save the people of Stavisht. And that was sort of a hard thing to do during the pogroms. There was a lot going on. So he was very brave, he was brilliant, he was multilingual, and he threw himself in harm's way um, so that they would bring him in front of the different bandit leaders. Every time there was a, um, a pogrom in the town, he wanted to negotiate with the bandit leaders, and that he did. Of course, he collected ransoms for them, they were looters, they wanted money, but these bandit leaders, they saw something in him. There was a certain uh, bravery about Pitsy Avram. He knew how to talk to them, and over the course of the three or four years of the pogroms, when they hit Stavish, there were maybe 10 major pogroms, um, and over 160 people were murdered. However, Rabbi Pitsy of Rome saved 4,000 Jews uh, in the town. They fled to other lands, and my family was, was with amongst those 4,000 Jews. So he was another brilliant bright light in this story. Um, another thing you discovered was about how your uh, grandmother shipped almost got sent back after entering New York water something like four minutes early at the end of the month and upsetting the quota system. So what, what was that about? Absolutely. This is, uh, we're looking at a picture postcard of my grandmother's ship called the Braga. Isaac, uh, her father bought this. You can see he scribbled his name in Russian across the uh, postcard. Lucky for me, uh, he didn't have a stamp because I am now the proud recipient of the postcard. But what happened was there was a quota. There were a lot of immigrants coming into the country. This is around, it began around 1921. Uh, they were limiting how many people from each country were allowed in. And once that limit was reached, they, re you know, anybody who came afterwards, they, they returned to their native land. So then we're, we're looking at 1923 because my grandmother um, took the ship, uh, went on the ship in 1923 and um, basically it became a monthly quota. So they would actually break it down into the month. So what is the best time of the month to come in? It's the first day of the month and the worst time to come in is the last day because chances are that quota is gonna be filled and you've gotta go back. So there's four ships. My grandmother was on the Braga. There were three other ships. One of her cousins uh, and their family was on another one of the ships. And they're sort of hovering around this imaginary line in um, the waters outside of Ellis Island, and they're waiting for midnight because they want to come in September 1st, 1923. So one ship decides that it's midnight already. I don't know what happened, and it went over that line, and sure enough, the other three just followed right afterwards. So they actually clocked the Braga in four minutes before midnight. So what does that mean technically? Um, the observer at Ellis Island said she came in August 31st and not the first. And all four ships were clocked in before midnight. And um, there was a lot of debate going on in the, in the United States. Um, what do we do? 
I actually went online and my grandmother never knew this. She never knew about this. So I don't even think they told the immigrants, which is kind of the most shocking thing that I found. It was across the, the front page of the New York Times and it said, um, ships entered too early, four of them, over 1800 um, are feared to have to go back possibly. So what I can say is they debated about it and they allowed the passengers to remain in the country. So she was then reclocked in on her passenger record. It said September 1st, but boy, this is what I wanna say about this episode, luck. There is nothing like luck. Everybody I think will find some type of a lucky story in their genealogical research. This is my luck. Um, if they sent my grandmother back, I don't think I'd be here today. Yeah, that was a real close call. <laughs> it was a close call for sure. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your grandmother's life after she made it into the country. Okay, this is, uh, this is grandma in the roaring 20s. Um, when you do get to that group photo, if you could just hold that. Um, her life after she immigrated, of course, um, they had freedom and peace and liberty, and there's nothing like that after what she experienced. But for the first generation, it was really, really hard. Um, my great grandparents didn't, they never learned English. So um, they really had trouble making a living. They were living in poverty. Um, my grandmother, on the other hand, she decided to leave school at 14 years old. Her teachers begged her, don't go. But she felt that, and they really did need her to work because somebody had to help to support the family. So grandma made these sacrifices. And today, my family has a better life. I was able to become educated. We have better jobs. I think this is true of all of our ancestor stories or most of them. The first generation always um, suffers the most, but they do it for their children and their grandchildren. So we could go on to the next um, picture. Um, this is Bessie Cutler's wedding. So Bessie is the lady in the back row right in the center. She was Rebecca's sister. Um, that's her. Um, this is taken in 1925 in New York after everybody um, was here in America. Um, one thing about Bessie, there is a chapter in my book. Her first husband, this is her second husband, the second marriage. Her first husband was brutally murdered in a pogrom in Sokolovka, Justingrad. Um, during a winter pogrom, she found him. Um, and then shortly later, she had a baby and the baby also died. So she really lost everything. And this is her um, her new life. Now, if you look over to the three children on the left there, um, they basically, the, the, the taller, the biggest, uh, yeah, the older child, that's, that's Hannah, and the two children underneath her are her brother and her sister. And this is grandma on her wedding day. She's quite a fashion plate. It's in Philadelphia. Uh, you do talk about some of the, um, the effects of her early life on her and her fears. How did that uh, manifest itself later? Well, on? I will tell you one thing. Talk about anxiety. If you were a child running in Ukraine from pogroms, people shooting at you, um, her baby sister starved to death, literally, on the run. Um, I fear that for the children today in Ukraine who are running, they, they may have some of these same anxieties that she felt. Um, she was claustrophobic because she was in tight crawl spaces. Um, she was agoraphobic because she was fleeing with massive crowds and it was uh, very, very overwhelming for her. She was a wonderful athlete. She was a ping pong player, a champion, but she couldn't ride a bike. She was just so scared. And then there's driving. When you have these kind of anxieties, um, I have to say grandma and I took driving lessons at the same time and I got my uh, permit and my license about 10 years before she did and even after that she just she never drew uh, drove um, she was also very afraid to tell stories uh, she was afraid to talk about this uh, her anxiety was just so great that um, I had to you know really keep at it to get the stories out of her and this is something this is what happens when when you survive such a massacre as she did yeah 
And I guess we have another one. That's my grandfather and grandmother in Philly. So they moved, that's where they moved and that's where they um, raised their children. Yes, their one daughter, yes. Um, so I think we have one more of you. Uh, my favorite picture, that's <laughs> me and my grandmother. That was taken 39 years ago at my wedding. And that's just, I had to have that in the book. So there are a lot of genealogists out there, you know, researching their own family histories. What made you decide that you wanted to make a book out of your story? Well, as a young girl, I really wanted to read about um, the stories that my grandmother told me. And I went to the library and I couldn't find too much. Um, and even as I got older, as a young woman, there was very little. Look, some Jewish committees, they did write, they took some testimonies down. Um, there were some pamphlets, there were a couple of books, but there really weren't any family stories. Um, there wasn't much to be told. Uh, I couldn't find anything. And I decided then and there that I wanted to research her story because I knew there was something to it and the world had to know it. And I started at a very young age. I was, you know, it's over 50 years ago. I was collecting stories. I'm not saying that I worked on it 100% um, of the time. Um, but I collected stories as a young girl, and because of that, that enabled me to um, interview people who were still living, you know, two generations above me, who were still living um, from the town and who were witnesses. And this is how some of how I got some confirmation uh, of what she told me. Um, so, I mean, you just touched on this a little bit, but I, I saw a review in the Library Journal that called the book a, a celebration of the essential work of librarians, archivists, and genealogists, which of course made me very happy. So I know you, you did a lot of uh, in-depth research. So can you tell a little bit about your research process? Well, absolutely. When I couldn't find anything, you know, very little and nothing, let's, let's be honest about this. There was nothing in English. I mean, almost nothing in English. I began to write, this is before and also after the internet came about, to librarians, to archivists, to other fa family genealogists with ties to Stavisht. I, I wanted to know what was out there. So as far as librarians, this is before they had historical newspapers online. They were kind enough and they were always so nice. They, they would um, send me copies of things, you know, from newspapers. Archivists were vital because I really had nothing to go by. And the, and the archivists, I asked them to, to search the archives. What kind of testimonies, what kind of unpublished? Um, Lisa, I think we just lost your audio. Oh, but can you hear me? Oh, you're back. Okay. Oh, I'm Go so ahead. sorry. No. Okay. I didn't touch anything. So, <laughs> okay. Um, basically, um, the archivists, I asked them to, to look for unpublished materials, and I did find they were very kind. Um, they sent me, they looked for um, unpublished manuscripts, and um, then I, I had to have them translated because nothing there is about, I got them from archives maybe in four countries, and they were in five languages, and I was dying to know what they said, and translators were key. Um, when they translated, Lauren, it was like a window opened. It was like I was holding pages on Stavish, literally, um, that confirmed what my grandmother told me. And um, it was it was truly amazing. But I also, in addition to um, the archivists and librarians, I did connect with other people who were interested in my, who were genealogists interested in my town. And they shared very, you know, parallel stories to my grandmother. Basically everybody who fled um, had a similar story to tell. Uh, do you have uh, any advice for amateur genealogists? I really do. The most important thing is ask questions and, and write it down. And it doesn't matter what age you are. You can be a teenager, you could be, uh, you know, on the older side, like me, a, a grandparent. Um, if you're a younger person, reach out and ask questions, not only to your parents, but if they have siblings and even cousins, because remember, first cousins also share the same ancestors. If you're lucky enough to have grandparents or anybody from the older generation, that generation, ask questions. Like I used to write, I was a little girl, I used to write to, there were a couple of widows of cousins of, of my grandparents and they were sitting on documents. I mean, they had photo, you know, the photos that have Yiddish on the back and nobody knows what to do with them. And also documents like passports or in other languages. And people don't really want to throw those out, but they don't really know 
know quite what to do with them. Well, they sent them to me. And that's really important for a younger person. For an older person, um, it's not too late. What you know is really, really important. Write it down, even if you're not sure um, that it's the whole truth. You say, well, this is what I heard. And also write down, who do you think was your um, first ancestor to step foot in America? Then from these oral histories, you can go into um, researching documents. And now we're talking about passenger records, naturalization, military, census. We have all of these records, but you need to start with the oral history because that's gonna give you the clue as to which direction and where to look. So uh, please, if anybody's gonna do every, you know, anything about research, write it down, record it in some way. So either you can go back and do more research or someone can use your, your records and, and do it themselves. So as you said, you've been working on this for a long time. Is there anything you wish you had known when you started? Well, I do have to say that, you know, I don't think before nine years old, that's when my great grandmother died, that I would have ever thought about asking her questions. I do regret that I, you know, I know that now. Um, and even questions that I asked my grandmother, and I asked a lot, I asked a lot more than other people ask. I do regret, you know, sometimes I'll say, oh, I wish I can call her and ask her. So my only, I, my only regret is not even asking more, even though I did. And um, I just want to recommend just ask as many questions as you can, because it can be the smallest clue, just little things she said. I was able to go way back in the, I had somebody look in the revision list and we went all the way back, you know, to about 1800 or, or close to that. Um, so a lot has been written about sort of the unreliability of, of memory and eyewitness testimony. So did you find that all these stories that you had been collecting sort of stood up to scrutiny or were you worried about including stories you couldn't verify? Well, I think my grandmother turned out to be a very reliable witness. She was an eyewitness and I did go to great lengths to uh, confirm her stories in many ways. Um, but it is kind of like that uh, game we used to play called telephone where you tell one story, it starts one way, it ends up another way. But generally it's a common thread. The core of this story, and I'm talking these oral histories, the core of the stories are generally um, the same. If she had, you know, but cousins will always disagree. So if she had a cousin that said a slightly different story, well, okay, I put it in a footnote. So-and-so said something different. Um, and that's why I have like a thousand footnotes if you've seen my book. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, obviously when you were working on the book or it was, you know, being finalized, it, the um, situation in Ukraine hadn't really, uh, the war hadn't started yet. So it sort of became unexpectedly timely and, and yes. heartbreaking. Is there anything you think we can learn from this earlier period to shed light on today? Um, well, I think one of the reasons why we, we didn't learn um, back back then is the, the records and the documentation wasn't that terrific. Um, and also uh, the Holocaust came about about 20 years later and their records were better, but of course that was a massive event. So it sort of overshadowed them. And also people um, basically wanted to forget, they came to America, they wanted to start anew. Um, what can we learn from this? Um, I just personally wish, I mean, I'm not saying there weren't any stories out um, about this time period prior to the Holocaust. I had a hard time finding materials. I'm sure, sure somewhere there was something, but I wish that there was a, a family story um, on, the, on the order of mine that came out prior to the Holocaust because I, I wonder, I, I just wonder, I'm not an expert in, in what was going on then, but did people around the world really know what was going on? There were a lot of people murdered. I mean, this was a harbinger of what was to come. Um, so before we take questions from viewers, do you want to tell us a little bit about your work with Jewish Gen and the Yisker Book Project and what Absolutely. that is? Absolutely. Uh, JewishGen.org is a wonderful Jewish genealogical website. Um, if any of your viewers have not um, looked at it, there are many databases. Um, I'm involved in two of their databases um, with two towns, and one of them is the Yisker Book Project. Now that's basically a translation project. 
a Yisker book is a Holocaust memorial book. Of course, this time period is 20 years after what I write about. However, um, they are memorial books and we aim to get the translations up. They're not all complete. Um, but these books are written mostly in other languages, Yiddish. Um, a lot of people can't speak Yiddish and other languages as well. Um, they're very important uh, genealogical tools. And one of the things that Yisker books tend, oh, by, and they are by town or by, some of them are by region. Um, one thing that you can find in many of these books are lists of names in the back of the book of people that lived in the town during that time period, people that were murdered, people that survived. But what's really important too is for people who don't have family that were there during the Holocaust, let's say you have an ancestor that came over in 1900 and you want to know about Jewish life in a town. Uh, go to the Yisker book for the town because the early chapters often tell you about the Jewish life during the earlier time period. So it's a wonderful project and it's an important project and, I, you know, it's, it, it's continuing. Great. Um, so let's take some questions from viewers. This one is from Sean. What lessons do you have for other genealogists studying the pogrom period and how should we set expectations for what we might find? Well, you can never tell what you might find. There's always a lot of surprises in genealogy. Um, can you say the first part of that question again? Um, uh, what lessons do you have for other genealogists studying the pogrom period? Well, I think that um, you're not going to find a whole lot of material again in English. Um, in the back of my book, um, there's a lot of really great sources in the bibliography, and it tells you where some of the archives are that hold these materials. And I think if you're specifically looking for pogrom information, there's a couple of archives that are very, very important, and you may even found, find your town amongst them. So I would definitely um, follow up that way if you're re researching that time period. Um, you, talk, you said you've been doing this uh, sort of research for 50 years, but I, you, I don't know if you've been working on the book that long. The question is, how long did it take for you to compile this history? Uh, 50 years, I would say. <laughs> you know, I started. I didn't do it, you know, every day. Um, it began with the stories and the last 20 years or so, I was looking at documents and I was talking to people and it just, it, it's almost like an ongoing project. Like if I was to stop now, I could probably go and find more. Um, that's what genealogy is all about. And um, yeah, it took me a, a really long time, but um, I'm glad that I got it out there finally. Um, Jane wants to know what European port did your grandmother sail from in 1923? It was Costanza in Romania. Uh, there were a lot of different ports. I think um, like Barney's family, they left uh, Romania and they went to a different port. I think they went to Hamburg because they, they couldn't um, somehow get a ship. But my grandmother came from uh, the port of Costanza and they stopped in uh, Constantinople. Um, and I, I mapped it out once. It was quite fascinating. Um, did your family face issues during the Depression? Yeah, I think all of us faced, faced issues during the pre Depression. Um, of course, that was a, a number of years later. Um, the man that Hannah married, his family was quite well off and um, they pretty much lost uh, almost everything, as did most people, or met, I shouldn't say most, but many people suffered here, yes. Um, did you ever visit Ukraine and your ancestral town? No, I did not. I had when I was a younger woman and my grandmother was was alive. I wanted to go with her, but she was too afraid to go on a plane and um, she had too many anxieties about going back. And my wish would have been to go with her. Um, and I never did make it over there, but I did meet with quite a number of people who walked the steps that she walked in Stavish. And um, it's quite fascinating. Um, Mindy would like to know, have you found any additional relatives since writing this book? <laughs> well, yes, um, I kind of knew they were there and, and we found each other. Um, you know, I was looking for people to also help me and with photographs and um, yes, of course. Thanks, um, Mindy. 
Um, Natalie wants to know about your great grandfather's time in the Tsar's army. He looked relatively happy, which wasn't the usual for Jewish boys and men who were often kidnapped. Well, I kind of think that picture was taken probably before he went away. So um, he looked pretty good there, but you know, he was stranded. He, he wanted to come home. His wife was um, pregnant with Hannah. He didn't see her the first few years of her life. He was shot at, he was wounded. I think it was a very difficult time. He actually, I don't know if you could say it's lucky, but he got shot twice and uh, he, he was okay enough he, to live the rest of his life. So he was sent home, he was discharged. So um, in that way, but I think, I think it's pretty rough, especially in those years. I mean, World War I. Yeah. And it is sick. true that uh, many Jewish families went to great lengths to prevent their sons from being conscripted into the army and even mm -hmm. so far as uh, mutilating themselves. Absolutely. That, there is a mention of that somewhere in one of my many footnotes. Um, yeah, they did. They, they busted their eardrums. They, they crippled themselves. They did horrible. You know, it, it's horrible to say, but I think it was it was a hard thing. It was hard for Jewish men too. I heard that you know they weren't obviously they weren't nice to the Jews anywhere, but um, also they couldn't have kosher food. There was a lot of things that I heard, um, so they tried to get out of it. They even changed their names, some of them. But in your case, it ended up um, sort of improving their uh, financial situation. The fact that you had ancestors in the army is that correct? Well, some of the family members, yes, they were able to, I don't know if it really affected my great grandmother, uh, great grandfather that much, um, but his two brothers who were also soldiers, they, um, well, the kids were able to go to school. My grandmother was going to be allowed because she was a daughter of a czar soldier, um, but her two uncles were in a little bit better financial situation um, because they had sold like, um, they were blacksmiths uh, wagons to the army. So their children could go to a regular school. So that way they benefited, but you know, is it, was it worth it to, to be in the army? I don't know. Um, there's a, I don't, a question about whether you were interested in using DNA to find more relatives? I am really, I love using DNA. Um, that is something that I would recommend, especially if people have like unknown relatives that they fear like they don't know what happened to them. I think it's fascinating. I like ancestry DNA and I'll tell you why, um, because there are associated trees with a lot of the DNA matches and it will help you in your genealogical research. And yes, I have. I also found one that remained in um, Kiev in a, sadly in a Yad Vashem testimony. Um, one of her cousins, there was an older uncle and an older aunt who remained in, um, in Kiev. And so, um, there's a question about how one goes about getting a memoir published about family history. <laughs> and this well, um, regards to your mom, Marcy, from her Hadassah friends in Jackson, New Jersey. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Mom's watching, by the way. Um, how do you get a memoir published? Well, I kept writing and rewriting um, and researching. And I think it was an inner drive um, because this went on for a really long time. And then I found this wonderful agent, Catherine, and a wonderful publisher over at Pegasus. And I think though, to um, be successful, if you are doing this, um, have a good finished pro uh, product, uh, write a strong query letter, uh, look for representation and have a really good uh, proposal. Um, how were you able to document or verify the pogrom specifically in your grandmother's town? I did find certain manuscripts. There was one in the Cherkova archive um, and also one- You're at Yivo, right? In at Yivo, Yivo in yes. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful source. This has always been the premier source almost for pogroms, but I did find another manuscript in Israel, in Gnezim archives. It's all documented. There's a, an appendix in my book. And I actually found pages on Stavish and it named people that my grandmother knew. There was even a death list that um, shows up in my book. And I did, I actually found some firsthand accounts. They weren't in English, but I found them. Um, are there plans for pogrom specific databases by Jewish Gen or any other Jewish organization? Well, they are working on a lot of um, documents and some of them include 
um, pogrom information. I, I think they're busy translating them now. I don't know how much is up, but they're trying. Um, I lost your audio. Oh. I'm not sure if it's just me. Okay. Can you hear oh, me now? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. It might be my internet connection. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, did you want me to repeat something? Did you not hear something? Um, well, I, I missed the last thing you said. I'm sorry. Okay, so yes, they are Jewish Gen is working on translating. They have some archival records and they are, um, especially on the Ukraine Research Division. We, I see a lot of them in progress. Um, they're translating that, that have to do and are associated with the pogroms. I also found um, there is a Ukrainian uh, genealogist who has been um, scanning and posting a lot from the Kiev archives. And I actually found, um, it's interesting, most of the stuff that he's scanning is in Russian, but there was a Yiddish list and that also appears in my book. So there are, there are materials out there. Um, there's a question about what was the response of world Jewry to the pogroms. I know JCA and other organizations work to resettle many Jews. Yeah, I think um, I saw that a lot of them were vocal and they took testimonies and they wrote books about it. Um, I, I don't know, as, you know, an in-depth answer to that, but they certainly were on it. Um, but I don't think that the whole world really knew. You know, I saw things in the New York Times, but it was sort of not really on the front page sometimes. Um, so I don't know what everybody knew, but the Jewish committee certainly knew. And there's another comment along those lines. I think the U.S. Yiddish press covered the pogroms extensively, and there's a yes. lot of information there. I will say that is absolutely correct. There is a what I call a tombstone list, a death list from the Jewish forward, the forwards. And they it, on it, it was on the front page in 1920, December 1920, um, that they were forwarded a telegram uh, from somebody about 100 people who were murdered in Stavisht. So yes, the, um, the Yiddish papers definitely, um, people were reading them. I mean, people who had family there, I'm sure they were reading these and, and this uh, appeared in my book. Um, there's a question from Ben. Can you talk a bit more about the archivists you contacted? Well, kind of all over the world. Um, years ago, two ladies in Ukraine, um, in uh, Kiev archives, um, they went through some metric books for me. So they were helpful about certain things. There is a, an archivist in Poland, Jewish archivist who had information about Count Bernicki um, because he was a, um, a Polish magnate who owned Stavish. So there was a lot of information about him and Stavish. He was very kind, by the way. He was very good to the Jews. Um, and of course, during all the turmoil, they, they burned down his estate and destroyed everything. Um, not the Jews, but during the turmoil in the country. Um, there were archivists in New York um, that helped me, Yivo helped me, Yad Vashem. Um, I, I can't even begin to name them all off the top of my head, all over the world. I mean, Ghanaism art archives in Israel, um, they were all very kind, they were all very helpful, and whatever they had, they try to share with me. Um, I, I don't know if this question was asked before you spoke about the Yisker books, but can you speak about Yisker books you have worked on or are working on? Yes, well, my two books are um, Kosan in uh, Subcarpathia. I don't have any ties there, but um, we're just starting to put, uh, some of it's in English, um, that particular book. Um, so we're starting to put up some information, not a lot is up, but you can read that in English. The one dear to my heart is on Pachayev, that was in Volin or Voliner, you know, that was um, hit horribly during the Holocaust. And my grandfather's uncle was one of the authors of the book. So um, he wrote most of it and he went in his car, he was an old man and he collected funds. And this is what they did um, from these societies that wrote the books. Um, and he made sure he was the one who coordinated everything. So I'm working on some translations. Um, I, I depend on volunteers to translate. It's very hard to get people to translate Yiddish. Um, very hard to find somebody who can do it. And when they and they can do it, you know, it's hard to get them to really do. It's a lot of work, but we're trying. And these are the two dearest to my heart. Um, this is a good question. Marcia would like to know what is a metric book. 
a metric book, this is how I interpret it, like in the Kiev archives, someone was helping me, this is of course before the war, um, that had like, um, like the towns had this metric book, like I found my aunt Sunny, that was Hannah's baby sister, her birth records, like they kept these metric books, but a lot of the years like disappeared or were destroyed. Um, and that's, you know, birth, marriage, death. Um, and they do have some of them in the archives and also that Ukrainian genealogist that I mentioned, he's posting a lot of the, uh, the metric books, but they're mostly in Russian. Sometimes if it's a, a Jewish family, you'll see um, Hebrew on one side and Russian on the other side. Um, there's a comment from Beverly. My Yiddish group would help with translation. Do you want to give your email address, Lisa, in case somebody wants to reach yes, out well, to you? Yes, well, you know what you can do? Um, yes, just lisabrayan at gmail.com. And seriously, if you could help me, I would love to. Um, this particular book is Pachayev. The Stavish Yisker book is up online in its entirety. Uh, most of that focuses on earlier periods because there weren't too many people who were there during the Holocaust and there weren't too many survivors. I, I wrote about the um, one of the only survivors that I know of in, in one of my appendices, but I would love help with Pachayev, so please write me. Um, there's a bunch of um, comments of people just saying thank you for all your hard work and they appreciate um, the research that you've done and they've um, read your book. Um, people with very specific questions about their own genealogy, I encourage you to reach out to our genealogy librarians here at the Center for Jewish History by emailing gi at um, cjh.org. Um, oh, here, there's a comment from Mindy. I read a recent article in the Wall Street Journal where you helped reunite a Holocaust survivor with his family. Can you tell us about it and how you came to be involved? Well, I'll tell you, a lifetime of genealogical skills came to play in two ways this year. One was with the publication of Tears Over Russia. And by the way, there's um, a family tree was just posted this morning on Pegasus Books um, Facebook page. Um, but the question about the Holocaust survivor, um, there are many groups, genealog Jewish genealogical groups on Facebook, and a woman reached out and she said, I have a father, um, he was a hidden child, um, he doesn't really know who he was, um, he doesn't know any family, can somebody help me? And so I offered to help, and uh, we used DNA, and um, also Yad Vashem testimonies, because he knew um a surname he had a, he he actually ended up knowing what his name was he just didn't know it was real because he was a toddler at the time and through yad vashem testimonies i pieced together a tree there were some other people that tried to help also piecing together a tree um but i studied what what i did was i studied his dna matches on ancestry and i actually researched his dna matches their genealogies and i connected i knew exactly when i saw between the two uh between the trees that i put together and um and the DNA matches, I figured out who his grandparents were, and then we were able to find a testimony. He was um, listed as dead on the pages of testimonies. We saw two or three um, listings. His family thought he had perished. He survived, he was hidden, he was a child. He ended up in an orphanage and he was um, adopted. But because of this, we found his first cousin still living. There were almost no, this is a devastating, um, they were from, I wanna say Lutz, but it's Wutz, I think when you say it, um, the Polish way. Um, almost everybody in this family was murdered. There was a cousin and an aunt that survived, but it was a, a massive family. These are, you know, almost nobody survived. And the aunt went to Israel and, and had a daughter and, um, I figured out that this must be his first cousin and we tested her and yes it, they, they ended up being first cousins and because of this he went to israel to to meet her and he's still there he's been there like a year he doesn't not quite a year but he doesn't want to come home and i i have to say that was one of the most heartwarming things like i received i think it was on i don't know if it was on yom kippur when you say yisker I think he and his cousin, his new cousin, they're inseparable, by the way, because neither of them really had um, family. 
Um, they, the daughter sent me a photograph by the grave of the aunt, who is the mother of the cousin and this gentleman's aunt. Um, and they had their prayer books out. And, and when I saw them together in Israel in this photograph, um, I, I can't begin to explain it. It was just, I was thrilled that I had the tools like from, from a whole lifetime that, that I was one, there were other people too, but I was one of, of the people that helped put these two people together. That's a great story. And it might be a good place um, to leave it. Um, I highly recommend the book, Tears Over Russia. You can see it behind Lisa. I just got a request for the email address at the center. So I'm putting that in the chat. Okay. Um, and um, Lisa, yours, you said was, I'll put that as well. Lisa Bray, and just like you see in the advertisement at gmail.com. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Lisa, so much for spending this time with us. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Well, Lauren, thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.